we build a new hospital and people don't go, oh man, we can't build that hospital. We're focusing on our healthcare problems. The city built a police, a new police department for Chief Getz. Oh wait, okay, you weren't there then. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody said, well, don't build the police department because you're focusing on our crime. But yet when you build, and I'm gonna get to the heart of this in a minute, but when you build this facility, people say, now you're focusing on citizens in this community that have a problem. So what's the alternative? We're not gonna help them? I don't think that's a very acceptable alternative. What Crossings is gonna do in this facility is provide high quality care. To me, that's not highlighting a problem. It's showing that you have a community that is proactively addressing a problem. And that's a big difference. I think it was the mayor who mentioned it. It was the mayor who mentioned it. There's a crisis across this country. You either have to be a hermit or a gopher not to know that we're in the middle of an opioid crisis. An opioid crisis is just barely touching it. What people don't realize is meth overdoses are up, cocaine overdoses are up, benzo overdoses are up, everything is up. So it isn't just opioids. They've kind of stolen the limelight, but the truth is there's a lot of other people suffering from other drug addictions. So I think it would be irresponsible not to do something. Just the opposite of asking the question, why are we highlighting a problem that we have? Now, if I was in a room, I could turn all the lights down, and this, this is gonna get to the heart of the problem. I could turn all the lights down and make it dark, it'd be black. And I'd ask this question. I'd say, because I've seen somebody do this before. Do you know somebody who has a drug problem? Does your brother have a drug problem? Does your sister have a drug problem? Do your parents have a drug problem? Are your, does your friend have a drug problem? Do you have a friend who has a friend who has a drug problem? And you know, with the lights down, you can't see the person standing next to you, almost everybody's hand goes up. It shoots up in the air. But I'll tell you why it wouldn't today, standing in the sunlight. Because there's still people that think, I'm not putting my hand up, they're gonna think I'm a drug addict. I'm not putting my hand up. They're gonna think my sister's a drug addict. So they hide it. We're way past the point of hiding it. Now, the one thing I've learned for sure is that drug addiction is the greatest equalizer in life and death. Because you can be from any home, you can have any parents, you can go to any school, be black and white, you can be from Asia, you can be from Central America, it doesn't matter. You can have great parents, you can have bad parents, it doesn't matter. Because if you are taken a hold by a drug, your life's taken away from you. It is a great equalizer because anybody who ends up addicted to any drug that person has lost everything that they ever wanted in life. I'm gonna tell you a story about my cousin, Bill Rogers. So Bill started playing a, car, a guitar when he was 12. At 17, I used to think he was really like, what's wrong with Bill? Because he locked himself in his room for two years. His mom would bring him something to eat, and I think he left once in a while to go to the bathroom. And he locked himself in a room for two years and studied guitar. He studied Jimi Hendrix, Wes Montgomery, you name it. He spent two years. He wanted to be the greatest guitar player in the country. Probably knowing him in the world. That's probably him calling. <laughs> um, at age 28, he was on his first gold album, playing for the Jazz Crusaders. At age 29, he was on a second gold album. That's a pretty big accomplishment. And I can tell you about Bill. He was, uh, he was really a funny guy. We, we have a lot of people in our family with a good sense of humor. It usually gets us in trouble, but um, he was pretty funny. He could hold his own with all of us. We played basketball, we played baseball, we did a lot of things, but the kind of person Bill was is, I can remember one time I was sweeping out my grandparents' garage. 
You're paying me 50 cents to sweep out their garage. That tells you how long ago it was, or maybe what my labor was worth. But so I'm sweeping the garage out. Bill comes down. He takes the broom. He says, "Here, you're doing it all wrong. Let me try and get it done in half the time." So he had this strategy on how to sweep the garage, and it was a little bit above me at 10 or 11 years old. But so he's sweeping away, and all of a sudden he hands it back to me really fast, and he says, uh, "Okay, good luck." And I turned around and there's my grandpa driving in the driveway and he didn't want to get caught helping me. But that's the kind of guy he was. He would help you, never looked for credit, never cared about who got credit. He just said, if I can help you out, I'm here to help you out. That was Bill Rogers. On February 11, 1987, my brother and my mother walked in and found him dead. He had overdosed on heroin. Now Bill was 37 years old. And that's not where the story ended, because then my mom called me, I was in Omaha, and she called me up, she says, you need to go find Tom, his brother, and you need to tell him what happened. So they call that at the sheriff's office a death notice, the death notification. When you do that in your own family, you don't want to do it again. It's not what you want to do again. The second comment, the statement that was made that Tanny told me was, by building this facility, we're attracting drug users to the community. Again, I thought, wow, okay, if that's what people think. This facility was meticulously designed, laid out, thought through, studied, and built for Macon County residents. We didn't go down and spend $60 million in Champaign. We didn't go down and spend $60 million in Springfield. We spent $60 million in Macon County for a reason, to deal with our issues and our problems. So when I think about that, I think, yeah, there'll be, there'll be a few people that come here from somewhere else. Like I remember two years ago, three years ago, a friend of mine, the deputy, used to be in Shelby County. I spent a lot of hours back then with him on the road and he called me on Thanksgiving and he said, uh, I, can't, I couldn't find my sister. So I went out, we were all getting ready to have Thanksgiving dinner. I went out in the garage and I found her. She was shooting up. No one in their family, no one knew that she had a problem with drugs. And he asked, How, could we help? We helped in all the ways that we could, but we didn't have this facility then. <clears throat> Today, we might be able to change your life. And part of that is not because we just have the residential rehab, the detox, but we have the transitional housing, we have the outpatient, we have long-term housing, they're building across the road. All those things are things I learned in the last eight years at the sheriff's office, how they play out in somebody's life how they either keep you from continuing your addiction or being able to overcome your addiction. It takes a campus to do this, and that's what we've built. And we had a great thing to start with, with Crossings Healthcare here. So, you know, substance abuse is really a health condition. And it's nothing to hear hospitals say, hey, we deal with organ transplants or health issues or um, cancer treatments or whatever it is, nobody thinks twice about that. But they don't seem to understand the drug addiction is a health issue. And I know what a lot of people say, because I've heard it. Well, you did this to yourself. So if, if that's the way you want to think, you know, you're being very close-minded about something that is affecting half this country or more than half this country, because it doesn't just affect, affect the person who's got a drug addiction, it affects their family, it affects their workplace, it affects everybody around them. So I would say, instead of going up to somebody and saying, what's wrong with you? I would ask them, well, what happened to you? What happened in your life that this is where you ended up? And I can tell you about a few individuals that, had the opportunity, that I've had the opportunity to visit with. We've had some people come through. Kathy Burkham's done a phenomenal job helping us with our program at the sheriff's office. And uh, 
We've had two people come through that are Army vets. We had one come through that's a Marine vet. These are the ones I remember. There could be more. And um, all three of them, well, two out of the three served in Iraq and Afghanistan. One of them I don't think did serve overseas. But all three of them, their problems started when they were in the United States military. So if they walked up to me and said, I need help, you think I'm going to say to them, what did you do? No. What they did was they tried to serve our country. So the answer is, what can I do to help you? That's the answer. So we've had people come in that have had, have had, have lived through incredible domestic abuse that have lost children and I know of someone who had a daughter that went to a party with her sister and her sister said no 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 it's okay take the pill it was ecstasy it's ruined her life there's a family that I know who sent one of their children off to college and they got a call from the police from that community in that city said so we have your son and he just barely made it through a heroin overdose. No idea when, how, what he was doing with drugs. And they probably don't really know what happened. But this touches everybody. And I think to think about it pragmatically, let's be realistic. There are risk factors. There are factors that influence how you end up in life, but you have choices in life. Biology, half the people standing here, 50% of the people that are born in this country, they have genes that make them more susceptible to addiction. Development, what happened in your early life? I could go down a long list of things that could have happened in your early life. Environment. Peer pressure, think of your environment growing up in school and peer pressure and other things that influence you, your family. Maybe your parents use drugs. Maybe there's no discipline in your house. Maybe there's too much discipline in your house. Maybe there's physical abuse, sexual abuse. Your own life, think of the guys that went into the military. That changed their life in terms of drug addiction. Maybe you were bullied at school. Maybe there's a teacher that made sexual advances towards you. Personality. Maybe you're stressed out all the time. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe you're impulsive. Maybe you don't know how to say no. Maybe you have mental health issues. Maybe decision making is difficult. Education. You have poor school performance. You have little formal support to help you make it through. You have trouble learning. You don't study well. All these things are risk factors. All these things can contribute to making a bad decision. And you can ask a couple of people standing behind me, how many bad decisions did they have to make to be standing here? They made one. They made one bad decision. And who knows what all the things I've listed off and the other 300 things you could list off influence that and put them in the position they are today. The people I've had the opportunity to meet and learn from, Kevin and Brandy are behind me. Gage is still in Tucson. Hannah's got her two girls back from DCFS. Mary's in treatment. Austin, Bradley, Troy, and Drew are probably here. I know they're here. Um, <coughs> they can tell you when they made a bad decision. We've all made bad decisions. The difference is that bad decision for them changed that life that day. And the one thing, I, I've heard this from three different women. One in Decatur, one in Arizona, and one back in Virginia. When Tanya and I went back to visit a jail program in Virginia, and this girl, and she was talking about how she came from a really good family. She looked right at you in the eyes when she spoke to you. She had a great handshake. All the things my parents said, this is what you do when you grow up. And she said, you know, 
Heroin owns me. Heroin owns me. That means that she can't make the decisions that she wants to make to make her life better. That's what addiction is. And if you haven't had it, you don't understand it. And when you don't understand it, you ask questions like Tanya has heard. If you're gonna judge somebody, make sure you have all the facts. And if you're gonna judge someone, make sure you judge yourself the same way you're judging them. And you probably can't do that if you haven't had that experience. The third one, Kevin, I'm really trying to see how long you can stand up here. That's what I'm talking about. That's good, that's good. Third one, this one really gets me. We are concentrating drug users all in one location and it's gonna cause more crime. That, that, I had to really think about that. Like, how do you answer that? But here's, here's my response. First, everyone on this campus is gonna live under very strict rules. You break the rules, you're out, okay? There's gonna be security here. Tanya has security. There's sworn officers down here. They're gonna ensure the safety of the campus. So I, this is my advice. This is not where I would commit a crime. <laughs> not here, okay? People are in a controlled facility. I don't understand the question. I'm not sure what crime you would commit here. Probably steal a hammer out of the cafeteria. But you're guaranteed to get caught and you're guaranteed to get arrested. So I don't understand the question. It would be easier to commit a crime off this campus than on this campus. And it's pretty absurd to make the assumption that everyone here is a criminal. That's a really big assumption to make. You know, I remember, this is gonna date me, but when Jimi Hendrix died, I didn't think, oh man, there's a criminal that died. I didn't think when I heard John Belushi died, oh man, there's a criminal that died or Michael Jackson, or Prince, or Whitney Houston. No one thought, wow, there's a criminal that died. They thought, we lost a great actor. We lost a great musician. We lost somebody who had spent their life trying to add value to other people's lives. That's what we lost. They weren't criminals. But somehow, when you walk in this door, you're a criminal. I don't understand that thinking. I don't know how else to answer the question. It's such an uninformed comment. Now, for everyone who can muster up a little optimism, and that's always hard for me to do, my wife calls me the most pessimistic optimist that is around. <laughs> She's right. Let's talk about what this campus really means for Decatur. First of all, it interrupts the cycle of inmates in our jail. And that's something people are gonna go, what do you mean by that? So, Tanya's group has started a program in the jail called Restore. Sheriff Brown has endorsed it. Lieutenant Belcher, Sergeant Flannery, the other people up in the jail have made it work. And what it means is that if you're, if you're in jail and you have a drug addiction, it used to be you could get some treatment and you walked out. And I'll bet when you walked out, you went right back where you came from, okay? So, and that's why that building right there and those buildings over there are critical to success. So now, if you're selected for the program, and hopefully it grows and it grows, you now get to participate in learning lessons, and we actually have a classroom in the jail. And in that classroom, you can get prepared to take your GED, you can learn other life lessons that you need to learn. Um, you can figure out maybe what some of the challenges have been to get a job, uh, and figure out how you're gonna deal with those. So, now, everything is different. Everything is different. They can walk out of the jail and they come right to this building, if they want to. They come right to this building. They can have outpatient care. If they relapse, they can go behind the end of this building. If they get their kids back, if it's somebody who lost their kids and they get their kids back, they can probably go across the street and keep those kids in a healthy environment and still get outpatient care. So those things, are not normally available. And that's what makes this campus unique. And I hope that it makes it a model for other communities in the country. It provides the most comprehensive healthcare available to patients suffering from substance abuse. 
That's what it is, that one sentence. That's what, that's what this campus is. And it's a unique facility. And, and, and Tanya, how are you doing, Kelly? I'm going to go, man. All right, okay. <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> you still look good, Doc. Pay attention. You still look good. Um, so you heard some of the things. The half-court basketball court. Somebody said to me, what are you doing that for those people? I thought, well, who are those people? You know? We're all part of this community. So... I said to this person, I said, well, you know, you have to feel good if you're going to get better. So if you want to get better, and Tanya talked me into this, we put <laughs> dental chairs in the building. That was a big fight between us. And then she went behind my back and got Romano to help, and that just did it. She won. <laughs> we got dental chairs. Who wants to go apply for a job with bad teeth? Okay. Who wants to try to overcome a, a problem that has put them at the bottom of their life without some kind of outlet, with some, without some way of feeling better physically. You're already fighting the emotions and, and the psychology of all of it and the physical addiction. So why would you not provide a place that all of us would want if we were trying to get better? So it's about feeling good when you're trying to get better. It's gonna provide people with their life back. And it's also gonna allow those people to become better citizens. They'll, they'll become active, productive citizens in this community. Aside from some of those people who think all they are is criminals. They will become productive citizens in this community and we will be better off for it. And the last thing, Okay, they apparently don't want me to say this. Schneider probably has a little thing where he hits a clicker. And, you know, Dawson's trying to get the train to drive by right when my, you know. I'm just dragging it out, Kevin. The most important result to me is it's gonna save lives. And those lives could be your sister or brother. They could be your parents. They could be a nephew. They could definitely be a cousin. Thanks for coming out.